if Scout goes for a counter pick, we then ask the question in a world where what do you pick blind in the mid lane has not had a definitive answer. Will we see Katie Rolster take away a champion Scout was a highlight reel on? Because if I've seen a great Azir recently, it's not just Scout, it's Yukal domestically in Korea as well. I am definitely right there with you, hoping for uh, you know some more levels to the mid lane pick and ban coming through. But I do think we're gonna have to wait a bit further in the pick ban phase to actually see that because so much of that is about, you know, like third pick red side, landing the two bans, or you know, holding through these counter picks with all the flexes available. Right now, I still don't see an Urgot or an Aatrox uh, or a Zaya. So those are, look like they're going to be the things traded here. Alistar and Rakan are also on the table. And that's kind of the top tier that we've seen at Worlds so And far. Smeb's happy to take the Urgot or the Aatrox. But what I want to draw your attention to is that Lucian was actually banned by KT Rolls. This has been a favorite of mm -hmm. specifically Jackie Love on Invictus Gaming, but iBoy has played it as well. Lane dominant AD carry, one of the strongest laners available. Zaya left open over some other picks. Urgot was not first picked by KT Rolls. Exactly. Aatrox banned. Urgot does not get picked. Still, they lock in instantly the Akali. Oh -ho! Now this, it is laying the groundwork for a possible exciting assassin matchup in the mid lane with Scout, but uh, it could also be transferred up to the top side for Ray. We've seen variations with Grasp uh, of the Undying in the top lane, and that might be something to give them more options later on. Now, if we do see a Tristana draft here, that means Zyra Khan go ahead is what Edward Gaming is going to be opting into, or at least going to have on the table. We'll see what happens here, because the Urgot has been left open for two rounds. I was wondering about the flex pick potential of Akali because they have the last pick on red side. However, we've seen the Urgot Akali matchup already, and a Freaker Freaks would not want to return to that one. So that does kind of pigeonhole to me the Akali to mid. It, no matter how much finesse you bring to a matchup against Urgot, it just seems like it's all in vain, right? As much as you can dance around and go for these big trades, unless there is a lot of extra help. Uh, the Urgot seems to stand strong each time. Here we go that we need to catch up because the Alistar, another critical pick and one that Mako and Mata are both famous for, picked up here for KT Rollstore before the second round of bans come through, even with the possibility of the Lovers duo. They would rather have the tankiness of Alistar's ultimate and the survivability after going in than the lightning quick long range engage but from Rakan. And the word engage, I think, is the prime thing to talk about here because Tristana Rakan is not necessarily a power lane by any means. You look at what they have already Akali, Tristana. Yes, Akali can go in, but she's no initiator. This actually frees them up to really focus on a counter pick for lane rather than also having to have the twin demon off. But wait, how does it work in the 5v5? Because they at least have one true engage choice on their side. We're entering phase two, gentlemen, and we'll get a little bit more clarity on those solo laners and whether or not this Akali will be brazen enough to go into Urgot. The bands Kindred and Shen taken off the table. And for Edward Gaming, still fighting the upward battle. This is the team that has to prove they can go toe to toe with KT Rolster. KT Rolster is one of the World Championship finalist favorites. And if you go down the champion select so far, just with three champions each, Already, I feel like Edward Gaming are upping the difficulty. It's going to be so much more difficult for them to execute. Yes, Rakan, very quick engages and can get the charm and knockups, but into Urgot, Zaya, and Alistar, yep. those are all very, very difficult champions to actually engage on. And then two of them are still extremely tanky. Zaya can self peel, so it. It really does mean that Mako's got his work out, uh, cut out for him, and they're going to need more emphasis in this area if they want to pull it off, whereas KT Roster seems a lot easier to pull this off. Only main stage jungler we've seen so far from Clear Love has been the Nocturne. He'll return there, but again, it's not really a comp you're looking at on the blue side that involves oh. backline threat and they actually reinforce it with a second round mid-jungle duo that wants to do some invading onto the farming Nocturne as early as possible. All right, we are gonna once again see the Nocturne versus Galio matchup though. So remember, when Nocturne Ultimate is on, uh, you cannot use your Galio Ultimate unless you're right next to someone that you can actually see with your own eyes and click on them. Uh, I saw a lot of rumors going around on social media and stuff about clicking on the portraits. You, that does not work. Nope. Unless you're actually standing next to them. So a little Mythbusters preview here. Azir now locked in, though. And that is kind of one of the ones you mentioned for Scout, Papa Smithy. 
It's definitely one of his power picks. It's a good scaling matchup into Galio. Think of the Lucian versus Galio matchups we've seen many times. He wants to farm it out, but you can see so, so clearly the KT Rolster on the front foot with this draft. They are ready to go as early as possible. The Zinjiao, the Zinjiao for score is a bit of a different look, but it fits in with his famous kindred, the Talia. He wants to play the tempo game, and he wants to make sure the game might be decided before Clear Love even can use that paranoia. Well, we'll keep our eyes on how quickly Edward Gaming can get to that power state. Akali, Azia, Nocturne, they need a little bit of time, but if they manage to make it through the early game, that power combination with the Rakan engage to back it up and resets from Tristana looks terrifying in the mid to late game. We've already seen Scout unleash Azia on the world stage. He's gonna have another chance against KT Rolster, Kobe. And it's gonna be difficult, but we'll see if they have what it takes. This is for first place in the group. Coming out in ahead here would be 3-0, stacked very well going into the second round. Robin, and you want that first seed because that means you can avoid RNG for as long as possible. And you got to zoom it out. This is for the 9-0 for the LPL. And when it's come to LPL versus LCK, for the best, better part of a year, it has always been the LPL pushing past Korea. Can the LPL equal the undefeated 9-0 record? That was set by the LCK. It's KT Rolster taking on Edward Gaming. And you can hear the fans cheering and chanting from Busan as they get behind KT Rolster. Four days into the World Championships, it already sounds like a finals atmosphere in Bexco and Busan. And especially that this is the last game of the first round robin. From here on out, we will only play one group per day. And the last time, and we will see these guys will be on Tuesday next week. So let's see who goes into the second stage of the round robin with an undefeated record of three and zero. Let's see whether or not KT Rolster with strong lanes, with score leading from the front on the Shenzhou, can take over the game and keep Akali and Azia and Tristana down. So we do end up with this return of the Akali versus Urgot top lane matchup. If you remember, Freak of Freaks had a strong wave clear comp and then Akali into Urgot. And we wondered, I sat there wondering, is there an item point without an amazing snowball in the early game where Akali just naturally wins and you can have four members of EG wave clearing and Akali winning the game? The answer appeared to be no with how tanky Urgot got. So I look at the side of EDG and think, Maybe it has to be team fights only from them to win this game. All right, Mato's gonna jump onto Eyeboy. Man, just to get the headbutt. Some good trading back and forth, but it's only level one. You're reliant on just those autos. Now the attention gets turned to Deft. I think aggregate HP comes out maybe a little in KT favor, but it's fairly even. There. Oh, there is blood in the water on the bottom side of the map, my friends. And this could easily attract jungler attention. Red buff has been picked up for score on the Jin Sao. So it's going through the river at the Scuttle Crab right now. And KT Roaster are trying to get that lane pushing ahead. Nocturne as well to the same side of the map. This isn't a replay, this is the same headbutt again going forward. Mata though takes a lot of damage, forced to flash, actually punished for his step forward. Game of Chicken is being won by iBoy and Mako. We already talked about Clear Love and Deft. Mako also was the support of Deft over in China. We've got Junglers joining. There is a flash available for iBoy, but he needs to use it quickly. The dash forward, first blood to KT Rolster. It's just so clear as his bottom lane trades over and over and over so aggressively. You have to know junglers are on the way. That's exactly what they look for on the minimap and well set up there by KT Rolster. Score heads down. He's able to get off the auto as the flash goes off too. So iBoy now summonerless and is going to miss out on this CS. Both bot lanes have been puffing out their chest to the point where we haven't even seen another lane. You wonder when to flash as iBoy. He chooses as the audacious charge, which has a guaranteed hit, is in the air. S score doesn't even have to flash. It's a freebie for KT Rolster. Busan is electric as KT Rolster have the 500 gold lead, and Score will be looking to punish that bottom lane even more. iBoy and Mako, they just got baited into that fight over and over. And you can see their group stage statistics thus far. 23% damage percentage for Def, 35 for iBoy. Remember that KT Rolster have run more carries in that top lane than tanks. Yeah, you definitely have to get out of there earlier because the way that auto attacks work in this game for melees, as soon as he's into melee range and starts the auto attack, 
The only way to break it would be by flashing out of vision of that champion. So it does complete. He gets the kill. No flash. And now score with the run of the map. First blood on a Shin Sao. He's completed his challenging smite. Uh, and this is one of the champions that has incredible dueling power. Absolutely, and it's a champion that might be looking topside because if there is going to be a window where the Akali can do well, notice it is Comet Akali for even more trading potential. You have to remember that Urgot kind of honor bound into the Black Cleaver first, so he's not going to be building magic resist till later in the lane. That reality means that if you want to get susceptible onto the Urgot and start the snowball, it needs to be early. Well, no movement there just yet. We caught a glimpse of the mid lane as Scout had been pushing into Ucal and Azir into Galio matchup. And Taking a look at Ray, put that ward just in the middle of that top bush and the wave crashing in towards him. Neither jungle is around, so not looking for any more shenanigans just yet. But EDG to bounce back from that early play that has set KT up so well. Meanwhile, Yukal here, he's using his health to try and push up the minion wave by walking in. He's taking a lot of damage, has to chug through his potions, but Looks like Score will chase Clear Love out of the river and defend that ward. Even though the Spire's Bloom found it, he won't be able to go over and finish the autos. Brucola does hit onto Makeup, but not going to be big. Clear Love is being forced into not being able to look for camps. For his benefit, nothing is up right now. So he does have the time to poke around and control vision as much as possible. He doesn't want to be responding to ganks this early, but he has no other option. Teleport used here by Yukal after he dug through all of his potions in lane. He's able to get some magic resist for himself and the refillable so he can continue the same strategy. You just want to AoE the wave, move up with Galio, and then support your jungler. This Galio from the mid lane is so great because the ultimate can reach very deep into both sides of the jungle, whichever one Score wants to invade on and use his kill to their advantage. I've always talked about Twisted Fate and Galio as that extra summoner spell for an invading jungler because you will get mid lane rotation first and that empowers you on a Xin Zhao with a one way hit to be able to go in aggressively and know you're trading up. One of the best feelings ever as the jungler when your team has your back. Meanwhile, on the top side, Ray and this Akali that we are looking for, uh, Making some moves, Yukal, though, protecting topside for a while. Looking at opportunities, seeing whether or not there was the uh, availability to go in, can also steal away some jungle camps. And this is a great start for KT score. We caught a glimpse of him killing those wards earlier. His Scryer's Bloom spotted EDG's wards. He was able to clear out the control ward as well. Unlike Clear Love, who had to invest that extra gold, Mako cool. does not get the knockup, and Iboy comes away way worse for wear in that trade. Honestly, Mata just running circles around these guys thus far. But now it might change. We have score slipping into the brush on the side lane. We'll see if uh, iBoy and Mako step out. He fast walked up, just to get the honey fruit. Who is pincering who? As for now, he's getting poked out a little bit. You just feel attention building. Who is baiting whom? Uh, in the early stages, EDG got baited. Score is very, very patient. He snuck his way up into that second bush in the bottom lane, but has completed the recall and will do so in a moment or two. Full channel and EDG, they were anticipating some sort of play. They were responding thanks to some vision, but KT decided to back off for now. In preparation for these team fights, remember too that once Nocturne turns off the lights, Yukal will have to wait for that to go before he can actually use the Galia ultimate. The whole team should keep this in mind. The timing windows are very important, but as long as they plan for it, they should be able to execute. And also, you know, if you're going to be the aggressor, if you're going in proactively with the Galio, then it's not going to be as relevant, right? Then you will be able to use it before the paranoia comes in. So it's all about KT getting the vision advantage and setting the tempo of the game rather than being able to respond to it with the Galio. Yeah, oftentimes you want to see the Nocturne ult ulting extremely early. So there's a lot of control in the veteran clear loves hands here. You know, he's been subbed into this game, even with a bit more shaky of a summer going for himself. He's now level six on the Nocturne uh, and should be able to actually uh, buy most of his jungle item as soon as he goes back. Right now he's hesitating on top side though. I think Urgot is just too difficult of a target right now. Yeah, not gonna be able to do so. Um, as Ray is just sitting on that Vamp Scepter as well. Smeb will be sticking around in lane. I keep my eyes on score. Once again, hovering around the bottom quadrant, the bottom lane in that tri bush. I boy. Steps forward for the trade and look at the minion wave. So there's a lot to lose if this goes wrong for Mako and Iboy. See if score actually comes into vision, still not spotted by this control ward. Just keep waiting for the engage. Score's got access to that ultimate as well. 
A lot of vision from EDG in the river, but it's come not in that tri-bush area, and Mata will be clearing out this control war. I feel like Mata has easily won the psychological warfare game now. Whenever he steps up on Alistar, Mako and Ivoy have to respect it. They've been punished too many times already, and Score has been so willing to camp on the bottom side that they they have to give up and cede small advantages now whenever the positioning is there. It's a 15 CS disadvantage to Iboy in the bottom lane, thanks to that first blood play from earlier, as well as the psychological plays that you talked about. Scout does a pretty good job there of getting out of range of you, Kyle, and Clearlove is still waiting to respond. He, it feels like he's on counter gank duty, they and want. he may be called in to support right now. Very good buffer from iBoy as here comes Yukal. The tower is the focus, and a teleport's being channeled. Paranoia comes in, insta taunt onto Clear Love. He's gonna continue looking for the chase, stepping on the Dustbringer. Feathers fly from death, but here comes Mako. Already used a flash, and he's not dead yet. Gets a follow-up knockout. Mako survived long enough to give EDG a chance, but it simply is not enough. There's not enough follow-up. Huge overstep there from EDG. We see Death lay the groundwork, putting all the feathers in the ground as he's running away, just waiting for the juicy blade caller, and he finds it. The proactive blade caller allowed him to flash back and basically have such a big width of targets to be stunned so they could turn onto one, Mako too far down the lane. This was the proactive ult we called for, but it didn't find any members, and you did wonder about the EDG re-engage. Exactly, they used it early because they didn't want to get blocked out from the Nocturne, but then on the re-engage here, EDG are just grasping at straws. They see this death all go down, they think that he is without defenses, but he still has the perfect play color on the two squishy members right into a single line. He actually hit both members of the bot lane and clear up with one blade caller. Meant that they couldn't join with any damage and it meant that Mako was a lamb to the slaughter. Big part of the counterplay of Zaya is seeing the feathers on the ground and being able to work out that trajectory of a straight line. Here we go though, they're right back at it, looking for dive number two. Oh, this is gonna be so difficult to get out of. There's no flash for Mako, there's five members of KT Rollster. They're looking for two. Iboy uses the Buster shot, but it doesn't get him anywhere. Score gets another. Mako will at least trade with Mata under the tower, but it's a two for one and tower first blood. Busan is tearing the roof off. And it's the proactive KT gameplay that separates them from the other LCK teams. They are gonna give up the Rift Herald, at least the start of the Rift Herald, most likely for the play they've made, but they invest their entire team and they pick up the kills and the turret. KT Rollster, a team designed to win worlds. They failed last year for even qualifying, but are looking to make up for it, and then some this year. I did wonder if this will be the game where we got to see the evolution of KT, because they were always a team that could play this way. We all watched on, whether you're an NA caster, EU caster, Korean caster, of the Telecom Wars last year, and were rewarded with many high-level games, but they always ran out of steam. The late game was not somewhere they could excel it in draft for it, they couldn't play it, but this year, in the second round, Robin, they've evolved past and have been able to make some huge comebacks, maybe none necessary in the first two games, and with a lead like this, maybe none necessary today. And look at the team play. This is Smeb coming down on the Urgot, trying to really just pry open this area of weakness for EDG. They throw members at this area. Five again from KT Rollster, finding success down there. They also get the first turret bonus gold. They open up the map, and this is going to be very difficult for EDG to fight for an opening. Especially when you consider the item disparity in the AD carry role. You can see iBoy on your screen. Got himself two long swords and attack speed dagger versus Ninja Tabai as well as the Storm Razor for death. And you think about how team fights will play out from an EG perspective in an ideal way. It's going to be Akali Nocturne, Rakan diving, and then basically the Tristana and Azir playing together and the peel being available with the Emperor's Divide. However, you need your front line to have threat and not just be blown up. and you need your back line to be doing big damage to be able to fight on two separate fronts. And they are now multiple items away from that sort of game state against a very tanky front line of KT. We were already discussing, Papa Smith, the, the difficulty of the composition that EDG have drafted for themselves in Champ Select. And now that they're at this gold deficit, it just becomes so much more of an obstacle because they have no, you know, healthy member to work with. They just have to work around the short timing of their crowd control, and that is going to have to be on isolated members.
There's one tiny advantage that EG can tweak in the next few minutes. They've got that Rift Herald sitting in Clear Lab's inventory. They can try to use that to unlock a tower and get something back, but they are in a two and a half, nearly 3,000 gold deficit, so they need several of those plays. It finally brings KT to EDG rather than what's happened so far, which has been KT controlling the pace of the game. So we'll see if it can be used intelligently or if it's going to be have forced out from the Nocturne, because you usually want to have some deep vision, some guarantees you'll both get the channel off, but also get the turret. We see Cleal have deep, the ultimate is available. But now, at least, Galio is in ult range himself. Yeah, Galio shoving out that bottom lane. Yukal returning to mid for a potential, you know, siege, potential poke down. But it doesn't happen from EDG. Instead, KT now, now may be able to dive raid. There's no wards on the map from EDG at all. If you look at the map here, it's actually pretty barren. They don't control anywhere on the map, and this makes these sort of moves so tricky. Exactly. Uh, they have no safe path, so it means they have to take a longer time to route all the way by their base to try and defend topside. They can't. They just can't go there. They have one trinket ward, nothing else, and they have to pay respect to the gold lead of KT. Yeah, and I'm looking at the inventory as well. No control wards yet. Very limited defensive vision from EDG. You need to see that improve as 15 minutes will crest shortly, and KT will take their second tower. Looks like complete domination thus far. Ivor is going to be forced to jump out with half of his HP. And again, the only window that EDG can open up in this game is the small timing of a Recon engage covered by the no Nocturne Darkness. That is a very small window to work with, and already KT are just pushing ahead and not even giving them any area to work. This is Marta with his pure mind games. We remember that famous interview from Doublelift, how dare he walk up to me at Worlds a couple of years ago. These EG players will remember Marta very well as well. He had his tenure over on RNG, Vici, over in the LCK. Rift Herald's popped, but it's a deep one. Very unlikely to find much of a charge. And Mata's looking for a return to Grandeur and form. He gets jumped on by Ray for now. The Rift Herald was used. He gets a bit of a boop into the mid tower, but there's the paranoia as Yukal's forced to join the fight with the ultimate. EDG need this to go well. They need to get the kills, but it's not happening yet. Ray's hiding in the shroud for now. They are unable to find a key target, but they don't lose anything either. Yeah, strong actually fight here from EDG. They gain the health bar advantages. It's going to be difficult for them to actually get an objective afterwards, but that was promising as far as being able to pull out the Galio ultimate, kite back, and then go for re -engage. And it buys you time that didn't seem like it was going to be available. If you compare how KT have accelerated their lead compared to, say, TL, who was in advantage in the previous game, you're seeing very high tempo plays like the Mata threatened from the mid lane turret. So Mata's failed headbutt pulverized, blowing ultimates and flashes. Does mean EG have relative safety, and it's not like their two carry solo lanes are having any trouble. They are putting together very impressive CS number. I think that's really important. We've spent so much time looking at the bottom lane and the discrepancies in the 2v2, thanks to the gameplay decisions. But Ray and Scout are ahead in CS. They've got their first big ticket items completed. And you could see the impact that that Akali and Azir had in the mid game. But it's going to be on those two to help Usher iBoy into the mid game because he's only just completed his Storm Razor. He's going to be behind an upgraded Zeal item very, very soon as Deft is getting close to doing so. EDG still find themselves 3k gold down. Ray is the target of four members of uh, pressure in this bottom lane by KT. They've got a minion wave to work with and he may have to concede some tower HP. Yeah, I think a trade is probably the best thing that EDG could hope for is they're trying to push mid lane a little bit this while, fast. while KT are finishing up the turret. It's so difficult. Urgot, Zin, and Zaya on a tower will obliterate it. But fortunately for the side of EDG, Scout and I will do some They're work. Still going. The All right, the base is being opened. 17 minutes in. KT Rolster. They're going to clear out the minion wave. They've got a couple of cannon creeps or minion creeps to work with. They open the base at 17 and a half minutes, and the tempo is not slowing down. Look at the cooldown on Nocturne Ultimate. It looks like they want to make this the chase. It's so difficult, though. Yukal does have teleport. He could arrive with the rest of the team. And with that, KT Rolster actually find them in the river. Here we go. It just feels like we're on a knife's edge this entire game. Every single moment, these two teams come head to head. There is a potential for an explosive engage. Mountain Drake has been started by KT Rolster and EDG. They may not be willing to concede. Paranoia is available as the teleport's being channeled by Yukal. Oh. It's stolen! Clearly, 
Dark picks it up, but can they get out? That's the question. Emperor's Divide will split up the team, and EDG sneak the objective. What a pick there, here we go. Look at the knockout, there comes Marta. The Emperor's Divide's already been used, but that's a great disengage. Buster shot from iBoy and a defensive paranoia. That was so important that iBoy got multiple members because the first target was in melee range of the other ones. Pushes them away, KT find no extra objective. And they forced to back away, not being able to grow the lead that they could 10 minutes ago. Considering the deficit EDG are at, really exceptional disengage as well as steal on the objective there for themselves. Probably the best they could have hoped for in this situation. So they count that one a victory. Can't believe I find myself thinking EDG could stall this game out. After how it started, it looked to be done and dusted. For KT Rollstuff, at the last few minutes, EDG have shown, despite the gold discrepancy, they can utilize their kit and their composition to make sure they survive. The team fight executions are still going to be very tricky from an EDG perspective. They have dive, but the only CC dives are Rakan and Azir probably having to give up his life to make the sort of big plays that was bread and butter couple of days ago for Scout. Reason why I say that is, you're not scooping up squishies, you're scooping up engaged tanks like Urgot, Galio, and Alistair. Yes. If you go for a streamer shuffle play, very unlikely to find death unless the Feather Storm is on cooldown. We said it would be very difficult to execute for EDG, so credit definitely given as far as the execution on the disengage, but they have to continue to perform at this level. The map state is a lot more healthy for EDG. No longer is there no defensive vision on their side. They are able to have a lot of coverage for specifically Ray on the Akali and the bot lane and starting to wrestle back some of their red side jungle as well. KT pushing up all the lanes, looking for their next moment. A lot of cooldowns available on both sides. And of course, we're 20 minutes into the game, so Baron is now up with the Galio and Alistair and all the damage behind them. KT can play the Baron bait as and when they want to. A lot of damage coming down from those Sand Soldiers already. A couple of autos chunking through Mata and Score. But look, KT pushing the wards into the North Quadrant, pushing into EDG territory so we can start this Baron off. Also pushing the minion waves up to the turret here. Yukao has gotten the wave. Mata actually Hextech Flash. All right, Ray gets caught out. Headbutt, Pulp as well. Chunked to 50% HP. In a dash over the wall. And he's got Teleport available to him, so he can recall and join a fight. But look, the tempo and the control and the pace is all with KT Rollstone. And it's all about that passage from top to mid lane. They get this turret half health as well. And it'll be forced to back away for now. All about the minion ways. To their credit, EDG, bot lane is pushed out, so there will not be a three-lane push. You can see KT just kind of brute force some damage on the turret there, shoving the wards in. And then on the way out, Yukal, Yukal uses his taunt to deny a lot of the damage uh, from the Azir, and they're able to get some damage on these turrets. In the end, though, Kate, uh, EDG still have life. Oh, this is a beautiful game to close out the first stage of the round robin. And I keep looking at the vision. KT got a, a little bit of damage onto those towers, but I think crucially, the ward that Scout just walked over and then two control wards, there's already more coverage than maybe KT would have expected. Running into five members of EDG, it's gonna be up to the LPL representatives to push back, regain control of their own jungle and try to push those waves back out. Because Papa Smither, you talked about it. It looked even. And then 30 seconds later, KT said, uh, sorry, buddy, that's not true anymore. <laughs> he completely took control. Such the power of a multi-man invade there with Alistair. You're always a bit more brazen about which rushes you can face check and which ones you cannot. I want to draw attention to an item choice here by Scout. He's going Leandri second, which was buffed in the path to 819, the world's patch. He's against some really tanky boys, some thick opponents. So I do like going for the Leandris here. If he's left unchecked, it's Axa. All right, Mako's gonna need to dash away to safety. Marta manages to look for the engage and decides to back away. Of course, if Scout can use the Leandris to just chip away, that's also gonna be exceptional value. And once again, we're just dancing on this knife's edge. 23 minutes, these two teams clashing. But EDG are further behind. It's nearly 5,000 as KT extend their lead further. And the split working there for KT, whenever they force Scout on the Azir up to a different lane, it means that EDG can't even look for that little quick opening around mid lane. They need the Azir as a core component to their big play. 
and KT Rosa are just keeping them pressured in. And Azir is one of those I only do everything champions. You can poke from range, wave clear from range, and threaten engage compared to Tristana who can only chip away. So now Scout is grouped. Urgot is away from his team, but there's no real engage option just yet would be far too brazen from Clear Love. So this does mean there's a slight moment for the side of EDG to find some footholds around Baron, as yes, you note there, quick shot. It is Ghost Flash onto Urgot. Much more about teamfight mobility than map mobility. Yeah, gonna need to push the wave and rejoin the KT Rollster squad. It's 30 seconds to the next Infernal Drake. This is the final fight for first in the group, and a reminder, if EDG lose this game, will be the first LPL loss of the world's group stage in 2018. And I want to talk about one thing that KT know that is implied rather than clear to all the viewers, they would have known that EDG spent all of their time either grouped in mid or trying to get vision around the red side. They know there should be no wards near the Drake. It's an Infernal, a very high value Drake, and there's been no access by the EDG members to be out of vision and actually put down any wards around them. And I think the Infernal Drake, when you look at the team compositions, even more valuable this game with four damage dealers aside on both compositions. I'd love to see how EDG play around this one. The last dragon, clear love, Smite stole that objective, and Scout and iBoy were able to disengage. I don't know if you can get pixel perfect execution that many times in a row. Yeah, plus the risks are so high for EDG to go walking through a blind jungle that it is just not worth it. The big prize, the Baron, is on the table. It is a very realistic prize to go for very quickly, and that's why EDG have to concentrate all of their wards in this area of the map. Pick your battles is what EDG has been forced into after their mistakes larger around bot lane the early part of this game, but they're starting to pick up some important purchases. Probably going to be double Leandris as Akali has a Haunting Guys and Azir has his complete. You see itemization like that and just makes the best use of the gold that was gotten, which we, as we know is four and a half thousand less than KT had been able to farm up. Now you need to start being a bit more tricky here if you're KT rolls. Yeah, and of course, uh, I want to see some tricks being played by Clear Love. Zero, zero, zero on this Nocturne. The bottom lane has been the focus from KT Rolls. It's accelerated the tempo, and this Nocturne has been near invisible this game. And for Clear Lab to be on EDG coming up against death, and KT Rolls and all the history of these players, a key paranoia could make or break his team's chances to claw back this deficit. But the wrong one might end the game. This ghost just popped here by Smev to cycle through his unsealed spell book. They're pushing in on this inner turret. They also have a minion wave on the top turret currently with Galio taking down the secondary turret on top side, just whittling away at it. KT Rolster slowly making ground in two different lanes at the same time. Minion wave is pretty far away. That's why I see Smev just pop the disdain, the W, and tank up the few shots of that inner turret. Still, this game state has stayed pretty static for quite a while here for EDG. They'll take that given how the game started. And I've got a, a sneaky feeling that Smeb with teleport on his active summoner spell rotation now will be a bit more bullish in pushing that bottom lane. We'll be able to react and jump into a fight as needed. Seeing a lot of interesting purchases here. We see actually Zinja goes back to base and only buys a stopwatch because the next fight probably tells the story of the game. If KT win it decisively, Baron, turrets go down and might be an unassailable lead. If it's a turnaround from EDG, it's not going to be quite the same. It won't be the converse, but it will be a very important uh, fire back there to actually just find a bit more even nature in this game. Yeah, I really do love a stopwatch buy here 27 minutes into the game because it gives KT Rolster more options. Previous to this, it's just about Alistar going in with the Galley ultimate on top of him, whereas Zin Sao, whenever Zin goes in, kind of the combat pattern normally is to ult afterwards, but that knocks people away. You don't want to do that with Galio ultimate. So now he can stopwatch there uh, after going in and they have multiple ways to try and deliver. And of course, that's where it's going to matter. You have to find the key target. You have to make that engage work because EDG have already shown that with the deficit, they can still put up the blows and put up the damage. Plus, they've got the items to back it up. The Leandris was completed by Scout a little while ago. He's already got that Amp Tome and Blasting Wand. Ray's very nearly completing his second tier item. Infinity Edge on the way from iBoy. 
And KT Rolster for the third or the fourth or the fifth time are sieging the inner turret. It feels like they will get it this time around. All outer turrets secured by KT Rolster and the LCK. They're freshly sharp. They've gone for the playmaking items in the stopwatches. They ha know they have to make it stand now because the items are piling up, just like we talked about in the previous game. When you've been in this bigger lead for this long, you need to turn the game into a different state. They don't spot clear love, but it doesn't take a genius to work out where he's at. But we see a big play here. Oh, trying to find out. That's flash for flash. Martin decides to go in. Clear love decides to go out. Uh, Mako's trying to find the taunt, oh. but he's already ready for his life. Going gold in the middle of the fight. Just standing, catches onto Ray. He runs for his life, but look at the fear beyond death. Clear love is destroyed by Smeb. And Ray is taking KT Rolster on a wild goose chase before he's cut down by score. And that will be KT Rolster taking the Baron afterwards as well. And with that, the push on the EDG's base. When you need a decisive moment, look no further than Mara. He goes in a while, it doesn't all register at the start. You can hear how loud the crowd are. They know who their best hope is for 2018, e and it's KT. EDG were dancing on the edge of safety, Papa Smithy, and they were punished for it. Mata goes over the wall, sets up the engage for UCAL, and Smeb and Score brought it home. In Mata. this replay, we are going to see the differences in the tankiness and the ease of execution of these compositions. Mata can go in on Alistar with the Galio ultimate, but then Mako on Rakan tries to engage on Galio. He's so squishy, he has to use the timings and the crowd control to be able to survive one of those deep fights. It's not gonna happen. So everything on EDG starts to crumble. Such explosive damage, and all the damage deals have to kite back. Mata has always lived on the razor's edge between genius and madness. Moments like that show you that his eyes are certainly in this year. They get that Baron that's eluded them for 10 minutes. And now EG know one more team fight and the Nexus is done. For a while, I had wondered if Mata's dial had been stuck on Madness. Now it is leaning more regularly, more consistently towards Genius and KT Rolster have once again proven you can put your faith in them but they have let their fans and their supporters down so many times in the past. I don't know if this time is different. This time there's something magical about this team that won the title in LCK and is on the verge of going undefeated in the first round, Robert. That was one of their biggest skeptics, but they've definitely been able to do it recently. Speaking of recently, pushing up to the base, Galio on the top side. Love has that ultimate. He can try to make a play, but if it goes wrong, the game is done. Remember, my friend, that the bottom inhibitor is exposed still due to the very early yeah. tower trading that we had in this game. So theoretically, a Baron buff, you just send uh, the bottom lane as your split push. They're not going to do that. They're going straight at these towers, though, and they should fall quickly. Oh, well, take a look at that. Mata once again finds the engage. I boys the target. The inhibitor turret falls. The inhibitor won't be much longer. Now, Scout has got the streamer shuffle available, but how the hell do you make it work with a 12,000 gold deficit? The exposed inhibitor, Kobe, will fall uncontested, unstoppable, improbable. And KT Rolster in absolute control at 31 minutes. Sort of game where you could end the game as 0 0 and 0 0 because you never had that moment to look for an aggressive play. It was so easy, it was bread and butter earlier this tournament, but for now. All he can do is watch along as KT take down two inhibitors. They even get an Infernal on the back end, and they're ready for the final push. This is going to be an easy reset for KT Rolster. They will return to the field, rich in items as well as Infernal Drake buffs, adding another one to the firepower here. And there is only one path left. One inhibitor turret left standing. They can march right out. I don't know about you guys, but I can feel my heart beat in my fingertips. And it feels like for 30 minutes of this game, we have been on the edge of something dramatic or something explosive. And this is the first time that KT Rolster have absolute uncontestable leads, where it feels like EDG need a miracle to bounce back. And as it stands, it was a good attempt, but I'm just amazed at the way in which KT have proactively set themselves up time and time again. But it's a bit of a sobering reminder that champions like the Akali in particular, now for Afrika and now we're seeing it from EDG, can find these spots where the 1v1 against Urgot seems unwinnable. The team fights against a tank lineup and a Zaya sound improbable. And because of that, 
we're really waiting to see the solo laners who farmed up a plenty find something. Speaking of solo laners. All right, let's take a look. Scouts has used his ultimate as well as that Sundisk. The Sundisk will help defend a while, but Paranoia's been used defensively once again. Two crucial, crucial ultimates if EDG want to win a team fight, if they want to mount some sort of comeback. Yeah, they're lacking in the cooldowns and they're also lacking in base defenses. Nothing left but the Nexus turrets. Edward Gaming and the LPL are on the verge of losing their first game here in the group stage. It will be at the hands of KT Rolster. KT Rolster now setting their sights to the Nexus turret as Scorp will be bringing the minion wave through that sun disk in the bottom lane. It's gonna be one only from the mid lane for now. The sideways will take a while to crash. Will we see a dive attempt? I'm sure we will. KT Rolster have done it over and over. They've got a significant lead at 11,000, and there's the dive, Papa Smitty. Mata goes in and is shot right back out. Oh! Nexus turret goes down, and look at the engage! Yukel finds Edward Gaming, wrecks them where they stand. Only iBoy and Mako standing. They were the force to fall at the start of the game, the last to fall at the end of the game. And KT Rolster will turn their attention to the Nexus, go undefeated, and have the LPL their first loss. Huge roar from the crowd here. You call Flummox CDG by flashing back in with his taunt. They took down a couple of members. They take down the Nexus. Worlds is not won in the first round, Robin. But Katie win the hearts of their Busan fans. They will go in 3-0. They are the big hope of Korea. If you buy into the narrative that the LCK is in trouble, that the only hope is KT Rolstein, Reminder that there is only one team that hoists the Summoner's Cup. And KT Rolster are looking at that cup right now. And they are looking good. Stepping out to bow before the crowd. They had control of this game since minute one. I cast their final game in 2017 where it was Samsung Galaxy knocking them out of Worlds qualification. And I said in that game, I don't think we will see the same five players ever play again. They sacrificed a lot to come together. All these players, household names of competitive League of Legends, but they did it to win. They did it for a stage like this. They made their big debut. The first round Robin has been very kind to them, but they first don't need to qualify. Everyone checks themselves with KT Rolster. Well, yeah, I mean, the group was, was kind to them. They were not kind to the group. KT Rolster wrecked their group. They are 3-0. and And today was the last day of the first round, Robin. For more on how it all unfolded, here's World's Countdown. It's cool.